Welcome to Under the Umbrella, a series where we invite experts to share with us the key things a homeowner needs to know about buying or selling a property safely and securely, all right under the umbrella. So how does this show work? On our table, there are a few questions that our production team has prepared based on the top questions asked by our clients and viewers. These questions are wrapped up in the cocktail umbrellas. Our guests will select one umbrella at a time to open and answer the questions that are wrapped inside. Once they answer all the questions, they will be rewarded with a drink. So let's get started. Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of Under the Umbrella. Today is a very special episode as I have two very distinguished guests with me uh, on this episode. On my right over here, I have Mr. Ismail from Propnex as well as uh, Mr. Roy Poir from Citibank. So maybe we can check in with Mr. Ismail first. Mr. Ismail, would you like to uh, share with our audience a little bit more about yourself? Hi everyone. Real estate has been my passion and being the Singapore's largest real estate company. We do have huge amount of data and market share. I hope to be meaningful in the next few minutes to share some of my thoughts as far as real estate business is concerned. Thank you, Mr. Ismail. Let's check in with Mr. Roy. So, Mr. Roy Poir, maybe share with our, our audience a little bit more about yourself. Sure, thank you. So, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Roy Poir. I run the mortgage business for Citibank Singapore. Um, you know, Mortgages are, are the biggest loan uh, that anybody will ever take in their lifetime and uh, it's not an easy decision and you want to make the right choices. So I hope that we'll be able to share a little bit of uh, insights into what you should think about when you're going to be doing your next property purchase. Alright, so in the next few minutes, we're going to first uh, ask Mr. Ismail some uh, very interesting questions that were actually uh, sent in by some of our audience. So Mr. Ismail, are you ready? Sure, I'm all the time. Yeah. What? I didn't know the radio was inside hidden. Yes, we have the questions prepared for you and these okay. are some of the uh, questions that our, some of our consumers would like to know. Sure. Okay, so given the very vibrant property market, mm. you know, in the last uh, one year or so, sure. so Mr. CEO, can you give us a simple insight to the latest market overview in the private property segment? Okay, I think we all know in fact, on hindsight, there were even a recent cooling measures that was announced on 15th December. The market was truly resilient. The property prices, in fact, went up by more than 10% in terms of price index. So the key concern here is this. What is truly happening as far as the real estate market is concerned? And I would say, you know, Rain, today, why people are actually seriously looking at the real estate as an investment or to upsize or even right size is simply because many other and the environment totally the many other attributes are positive first the economy is generally doing well recovery from the covid not forgetting the fact no doubt there is this talk about the interest rate is going to go up but regardless the interest rates are still rel relatively low today we are talking about less than two percent even with a possible hike it is not expected to cross the three percent mark in the near future so that being the case people are truly taking advantage especially when the developers are pricing it sensitively and obviously work from home has been another big challenge for a lot of our listeners and audience out there because that means we need a bigger space for some of us and what better way than to take advantage of a market which is generally considered as a bias market and why do i say that rain is in a bias market today especially so all the more with the cooling measures developers are very very careful in their pricing and therefore i think the real estate market by and large is relatively res resilient and it is also an environment that is relatively safe why do i say safe because today we don't have speculators in the market unlike in the past when people come and just uh, churned or try to game such as to make a quick profit today because with all the cooling measures ever since 2013 i mean we have got total debt servicing ratios and we have got additional stamp duties and as well as we have got absd which is the same as as, as i mentioned earlier additional stamp duties but it, there's also a component of seller stamp duties so with all this put in place today's buyers are those who are buying the property within a mid and a long term and that's why i think the real estate market is really a positive in terms of its uh, demand and its performance. 
Definitely, I concur with Mr. Ismail on this being on the, on the ground myself. Uh, I think uh, the consumers uh, are not really dampened by the recent cooling measures. And then, of course, uh, we are getting a lot of still interest on a lot of uh, the appointments in terms of uh, viewings. I think it's still considered uh, very, very positive. So maybe, Mr. Ismail, we'll let's move on to the next question. Sure. Okay, let's look at this one here. Our viewer here would like to ask Mr. Ismail this. So Mr. Ismail, what do you think is the difference in terms of the transaction volumes and the property purchases in the Singapore market pre and post COVID? Okay, I think if you look at it broadly speaking, um, last year was exceptional, I must say. I mean, if you look at it, the new launches, the new launches in year, 2020 was about 10,000. But in any case, we have done this analysis. Over a period of 10 years, the average was about 10,000. And over a period of 20 years, the average was about 11,500 in terms of demand for new launches. But last year, we hit 13,000. But it was not record. There were years that sold 14, 15,000. But 13,000 was under 30% more than the, the year uh, year compared to year 2020. But where did all the demand came from? One of the key things here is, is we notice a lot of HDB upgraders are taking advantage and these numbers are huge. And uh, the OCR outside the central region and the rest of the core central region also did exceptionally well. So this is as far as the new launches. But when we look at the resale market, the numbers were staggering because in 2020, we only had about 10,800. And last year, we are talking about 17 to 18,000. There was 70 to 80% increase in the volume. And then we attribute it for simply for a couple of reasons. Work from home actually during the COVID prompted a lot of people to rethink. And they went for the resale property because unlike a new launch, people have to wait for four to five years. Resale property, you get the roof immediately and what they wanted was an additional space and they do not want to be so confined. They wanted to have the lifestyle of the swimming pool and the facilities. And that's why the resale market was truly strong. So having said that to the questions where actually the market was truly, the resale properties did well uh, as far as the private launches are concerned uh, and as well as the new launches are concerned also did well. And even though you were only focusing on private property, even HDB, last year had more than 30,000 and that's definitely a positive number. So in terms of pre and post COVID, we still see a very strong demand, mm. you agree with me? Yeah, beyond doubt. I think all numbers shows that uh, every segment have grown by 30-50% more than the previous year. And I guess that's the reason why we had this uh, sudden cooling measures yeah, and, and I and I do and I do actually welcome the cooling measures. Honest truth, you know why? I mean, put it this way: to I'm quite sure that many of you who are right now viewing it, that why did the government always wants to come and temper with the free market? Why not let the market run by itself? But the point here is this: what we need here is sustainable growth, and that's important because when the real estate market grew by more than 10 percent in a singular year. Obviously, Rain, I, I'm, I'm certain it is not sustainable. Put it this way. If a property prices goes up by 10%, and if the government do not come and step in, can you imagine 10, 10, 10 over a three years or five years, a property that is worth 2 million is going to be 3 million in a short period of time. But our income don't keep pace with it. So that's why the government came in to say that, hey, let's have a sustainable growth. And with, by all logic, and I'm expecting this year, the property prices not to go down, still go up, three to five percent which is i think is acceptable keeping pace with inflation and as well as our gdp the growth that's reasonable uh, I, I definitely agree with you, with you on that because some of my clients they actually do welcome this uh, set of cooling measures because they were very very afraid of actually getting price out uh, with the income not catching up on the based on the affordability so i guess it's something um, not to be too concern about at this current moment. Yeah, let's move on to the next question. We have so many questions to ask Mr. Ismail. Okay, let's see. 
All right, this one says, um, in terms of percentage, Mr. Ismail, out of the private property transactions made in 2021, how many percent do you think were more towards own stay and then how many were then for more towards investment, in your opinion? Or maybe you, you, you can share with us a bit more. It could only be in a gut feel, but our data's research showed that um, and again, it goes by location, whether is it in a core central region or is it the OCR and RCR. By and large, when you look at the outside the central regions, which is the mass market appeal, I would say a good 80 over percent are for owner occupier purposes. And most of these buyers were actually first timers or an existing HDB owner who have decided to upgrade for a better lifestyle. I mean, put it this way, we had like water gardens or, or even Clementi uh, area and many of these places. Uh, the mass market appeal, uh, I would say, hugely is owner-occupied. But there were still some who were buying from an investment angle, especially the smaller units, the one bedroom and two bedroom. But then when we move closer towards the central location, I must say it could be about 60-40. 40% of the buyers are looking from an investment angle. And that again have got to do with the size of unit. Because we see like some development, look at like Canning Hill Piers. We did very well. I think the developers sold about close to 500 units. But they have a huge number of one bedroom. How can one we say that one bedroom is an owner occupier unless it's in a single? Yeah, so it's very much of on a location base, but broadly speaking, in the central area tend to be about 40% investor, maybe 60% will be owner occupied. Yeah, I, I noticed that in 2021, most of the launches may be more inclined towards their own stay or investment. They all sold very well on launch day. Mm -hmm. uh, do, do you agree with me? I mean, broadly, yes, I agree. In fact, almost every launch did well. Uh, there was more of a uh, uh, demand factor that was pushing the market. Put it this way, a couple of developments I remember, be it Irwell, be it Canning Hill Pierce, Pass Series 8, yep. Uh, Javois mentioned, I mean, just to name a few, we had more than 20 over launches, but almost most of the launches or the launch weekend sold 70, 80 uh, percent. But that's the point I'm trying to say. It is because price right. Developers were taking into consideration of overall the current economy and people were taking advantage of the interest rates. That matters. If the interest rates are huge, I think it stops the ability for people to uh, stretch themselves. Yeah, so things were, everything was lined towards a positive aspect from a bias looking at the investment. So I believe that was a pretty good year for Mr. Roy as well as Citibank. Well, um, banks are, are there to support property purchases uh, through mortgages. And, and so when uh, property purchases are going well, uh, mortgages are doing well. Yeah. So, so we, did, we did have a good year last year. I'm quite sure. I'm quite sure. With, uh, we, with record transaction volumes, uh, you know, clocking in in 2021. Okay, let's, let's just proceed on with this one. So, Mr. Ismail, just one more. What are some of the trends you have seen in consumers' property loan decisions over the years? Yeah, I think put it this way, today, uh, even if anybody wants to take a loan, uh, it's very much guided. Total debt servicing ratio have already have put the OB markers and as well as the guidepost, if you call it, that one could not qualify to take a loan beyond certain amount. Yeah. Uh, so there were people who, are, who prefer a fixed interest rate because they feel comforted because they, they are not very certain, but they do not want to take the risk of uh, changing uh, interest rates and they may be exposed. But a lot of savvy investors, I notice, choose to have the flexi mode because they read the market well because they have been in the market and they know that even if the, market, the interest rate goes up, they have the capacity and the deep pockets and they want to just enjoy the flexible rates that were priced slightly lower than the fixed interest rates. So actually it is an individual's uh, preference but broadly speaking, I would say whether you take fixed or floating, interest rates are something that not in many part of this world you enjoy such low interest rate and Singapore is really positioned well. 
definitely being an investor myself, uh, I also have to take my own share of mortgage, right? And I was, I would really think that uh, Singapore's mortgage interest rate is relatively low. Am I right to say that? Well, I, I think if you uh, think about pre-COVID to now, uh, for sure, interest rates are much lower. Uh, before COVID, interest rates were hovering just above two percent. Uh, but in the last uh, year or so, um, on, on the flexible interest rates, uh, we are seeing rates that are about 90 basis points, so about 1.1%. 1, 1. 1%. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so the interest rates have been low uh, since, since uh, COVID started. Okay, how has Propnex adapted to the new digital drive in its service to clients? Oh, I think, um, I'm really must say that um, probably we may have a catalyst. We may be the catalyst, the way we shaped and shifted the buying patterns. And I remembered very well when circuit breaker, when all of us have to stay home, it was a great concern for us. How is are our sales force for two months staying at home, not showing units, are going to do a deal? But I think that's where the digitalization process was key to our success. We literally brought a lot of properties on a virtual tour and as well as we conducted a virtual property expo and training our salespeople to be able to adapt to this was in fact a huge positive point. And by the end of the two months, I, I was really surprised to see, in fact, during the circuit breaker itself, that when some of the salespeople shared with the rest of our agents, that a million dollar deal, a two million dollar deals were all done virtually without even having a physical visit to the show flat. Yeah, so, so it is about training, it is about believing. But one of the key things beyond that, the COVID have also pushed our salespeople to adopt more of digitalization. And the consumers were ready to receive it. And, and this quickened the pace of productivity. And that was one of the very positive outcome of COVID as far as the business model are concerned. And today you see, even though like the, we do, are not having a circuit breaker, but in the past, when maybe even as an audience, if you are hearing in the past, if you are going to see a property, I'm quite certain the agent will show you 20 properties and four weekends or three weekends you just block off and you just go on like a shopping uh, activity seeing property. But today you don't need to do that. And I'm saying and we are experiencing a lot of, of the customers want to narrow down by virtually looking at it. And they say, no, 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 this is not my liking. This is not my liking. Instead of looking at 30 properties, they just narrow down four or five. And that's where I think it has changed. And this is the way to go, I believe. Definitely, I agree as some uh, myself on the ground, right? Uh, definitely during circuit breaker, we were a bit worried, but thankfully with the very strong direction for digital drive from Propnex, uh, I'm very proud to say that during the circuit break, the period while staying home, I did manage to transact both new launches and, and mm. sale yep. without my consumers actually visiting the yep. actual unit itself. So, yep. so that led us to really believe that actually it really can be done and then of course yep. from uh, you know, with more transactions being done and uh, more willingness from the consumers to actually be doing uh, the viewings via this virtual mode. And I yep. think this is definitely one of the positive outcome. takeaways of yep. the outcome from COVID. Let me see, let's move on. So Mr. Ismail, in what ways has Propnex equipped their agents to help their clients make better financial decisions? Sure. I think, um, think whoever who asked these questions, I'm thankful because, you see, buying and investing in real estate is not an easy decision because we are talking about all your savings, your life savings for some of them or for most of us. And we are going to lock in ourselves a commitment that you cannot change a decision even don't talk about two weeks, even six months down the road, because there will be such a thing as seller's stamp duty if you sell and you're going to lose money. So it is a huge decision. And what we have embarked here is this. We have, other than empowering our salespeople in terms of the training and giving them the tools, um, 
we are in a very privileged position because of data. So you know, data are very, very important. Then maybe even as an audience, you may be wondering, what is the real effective role of a salesperson? Are they not just mere middlemen? Why can't we go and buy a property from looking at some internet or portal or some platform? But my advice here is this, it is going to be a major decision in your life. And how often do we buy a property in our lifetime? Can we afford to make a mistake? Therefore, PropNex salespeople are trained in terms of its knowledge, in terms to understand is that property likely to be an asset or liability over time, the entry and the exit points. And, and that's why training become paramount. But as far as from a consumer perspective is concerned, Rain, you know, I think we conducted well above more than 100 consumer seminars in one year. That means every week we have got more than two or three consumer seminars. And why do we want to do that? It's because we want the consumers to be not making an emotional decision, but a decision based on facts, figures, and numbers right. Because we know that it is a huge commitment. And we came out last year with a monopoly game for all our salespeople and we call it as a learning challenge for our PropNex salespeople that 3,000 over of my agent have gone through this training. It is not a monopoly just for fun, but incorporating Singapore's real estate landscape coupled with the cooling measures about the additional stamp duties so that people know by playing the game that actually we are not attending a seminar, emotional make a decision, that you can actually can go bankrupt if you did not plan right. So these are some of the things that we have incorporated as part of design, training, and as well as reaching out to the consumers. At the end of the day, we only have one objective. We want every customer who walk through the journey and make a purchase through PropNex. It is a journey that they value it, and whatever they buy is something within their means. And over time, we want them to be a prop next friend. Yep. And we are not here to make a deal, but we want to walk the journey together with them over time. All right, Mr. Ismail, before I get engaged with Mr. Roy over here, maybe one last question over here, maybe a tip or advice for our consumers. How do you think um, consumers can keep themselves abreast of the latest developments in the private property segment? Okay, fine, fine. I think it's really important. I would not even say it's only for private property, even if you're on a HDB owner, because we have got million uh, HDB owners. It is so important that we should look at property and we should revisit our property portfolio once in a while. Then the question, how often is once in a while? When you buy shares, probably you want to say on a daily or weekly basis, if you're a trader, yep. But on the other hand, as a property, at least once a year. Because we may have bought a property five years, 10 years down the road. Thinking is an asset, but we cannot forget and rule out. Over time, our property, which was an asset five or 10 years ago, could be a liability. I tell you why lease decay. When you bought, if assuming it's a resale property, balance lease was probably 75 years or 79 years. But right now, 10 years later, it's 69 years balance lease. How long would you want to stay before the next person can enjoy the balance lease? There isn't a concern. But within the last five years, the property that you bought, maybe there's some other newer development or there may be a, a master plan change where there's another commercial shopping bell where the interest on the rental yields are more effective on the next neighboring plot where your property start to stagnate in price. So do you want to hold on to a property that when you bought it five years ago, which has appreciated over a period of the last five years, but it goes to a stagnation period? Would it not be wise for you to do an evaluation to say that should you upgrade, should you hold on? So that's why I always say it is good for every one of us who are property owners to revisit. And one way for you to keep track is very, very simple. Believe me, it doesn't cost you a dollar. Just go to www.propnext.com, be a Propnex friend. As long as you are a Propnex friend, you will be able to tune in to Propnex TV 
and you will hear me most of my latest update cooling measures whatever it is it is all available free but on a monthly basis we have a report depending on segments as, as long as you already released the price index or the quarterly basis numbers a research report by our research team is all loaded there and you can download them free that's one way to stay connected as far as your real estate investments are concerned Definitely every consumer should be well informed uh, with all the statistics and I think Propnex has got a good platform um, free of charge of course for you to find out more about all these insights uh, monthly. So thank you Mr Ismail for uh, answering all the questions, uh, definitely very good tips and advice given to our consumers uh, who are watching now. Uh, and definitely now we're going to move over to speak to Mr Roy and thank you for being so patient uh, waiting for us. So I'll Very just interesting listening to Ismail. Oh, thank you. Yeah. All right. So Mr. Mr. Roy, um, we'll just begin with some simple questions here. So to share with us, uh, in fact, our our consumers who are watching in, what is the process of applying for a private property home loan? Okay. So you know, typically there are there are two uh, two general approaches that we've seen. Uh, the first one is when a customer already has an OTP. So they've, they've found the property, they like it, they've got an option to buy um, and then they approach a bank to um, work out the mortgage or the loan. Right? Um, most people would leverage when they, take a, when they buy a property. It's, it's, um, it, it's a very common thing to do. Uh, the other approach is um, where a person may not have found a property yet, starting on the shopping journey, um, but you want to know how much you can afford. And, and that, that kind of, again, makes things efficient. You're not going to be looking at houses where you might not be able to afford it. Um, or you might, not, you might want to be looking to maximize the amount of uh, loan that you can take so that you can, you can, you can leverage to the maximum and, and get, get, the, get that dream home that you want. So that other approach is where a, a customer then approaches a bank and says, I'd like to do an in-principle approval. And what that means is that um, the bank would go through the application process um, without any specific property in mind, uh, but that, that customer would then know that this is the budget that I can work with. And then from there, they can go into the market and they can kind of look around for properties that uh, fall within their budget. Right, I definitely um, actually advise all my clients to actually do the in-principle approval with the banks first. So to make their search a little bit more meaningful and I think that's where uh, you guys come in and actually assist on that process. Which I think is a very important process so that uh, our clients buy in a very prudent manner and buy within their affordability. I think that's actually the key to, to, to every property's purchase. Alright, so Mr. Roy, so Roy, um, there are many types of interest rates packages for, for property loans. Uh, how can a consumer decide which one is best for that particular individual? Right, that's an interesting question and I, I get asked this very often. Uh, you know, is it better to take a float rate or a fixed rate? So generally, there are two types of rates in the market. There are floating rates and there are fixed rates. Now, how it works is a fixed rate package. Uh, typically two or three years is such that the interest rate is fixed and for packages like that the customer knows exactly what they're going to be paying over the next two or three years at the expiry of the two or three years the mortgage package then reverts into a floating package right? and the customer can have a, an opportunity to reprice or to decide that they want to take a, another fixed rate package at that point in time the, the other sort of uh, mortgage package is a floating rate package. Now in Singapore, um, again, there are many nuances out there, but generally the floating rate packages are referencing SORA. SORA stands for Singapore Overnight Rate Average, and that's a new index that had replaced Cybor uh, last year. Uh, and that's, that's really a, a compounded overnight rate, either one month or three months. And that is the reference rate for which uh, floating rate packages are based on. Um, now, which package to choose? It really depends on the, uh, the view of the customer in terms of what they think the interest rates are going to be in the next two or three years. Uh, and, and as, as uh, Ismail had mentioned, uh, it depends really on the risk appetite and, and, the, and the outlook of the customer in terms of where the interest rate environment is going to be. 
and, and so it's a choice that the customer has to make. There are no right or wrong uh, decisions, uh, but the, the customer should be well informed and um, you know the banker is always there to, to assist, uh, to show the customer the historical rates so that the customer can make a more informed decision. Definitely, for all the consumers, uh, definitely advice um, for you to actually evaluate which package is better uh, for you by speaking to a professional banker so that they, you can actually pick the right package for you and your family. And how does the bank determine how much one can borrow? Are there any ways that they can kind of increase it if they, they, they need to? Yeah, so uh, uh, Ismail had already spoken about TDSR. TDSR is a big guiding principle. Uh, it, it, it's a regulated principle, so it applies to all property purchase, all borrowing in Singapore, right? It's, it's not bank determined, it's a, it, it's a regulation. And so TDSR generally is the guidepost or the OB markers, as this one called it, uh, to the amount of borrowings a customer can have. Uh, the way to, um, uh, you know, look at borrowing is either you, you decrease your debt or you increase your income. So, so the ratio works that way, you know. Not so easy to decrease your debt uh, because that's typically a function of how you live um, and, and, and the, the, the expenditures that you have. Uh, so the other way to, to look at it is to uh, increase income. Now what that means is that you could bring on a co-borrower. You could bring on a spouse uh, who has to be, then be a co-mortgagee or a co-owner of the property. Uh, but, but TDSR would be viewed in, in, in total based on um, on the borrowers that are buying the property, so that's that's how uh, customers should think about, um, you know, how much loan they can take. I think there are different ways whereby the clients can explore to actually increase the mortgage whenever necessary. However, you really uh, advise to speak to a licensed realtor like myself, or definitely from the banker side. Right, so uh, Roy, could you tell us a little bit more whether there are any differences in taking a loan uh, for a new launch which is building under construction versus a property that has been completed? Okay, so the key difference is um, that for building under construction or what we call BUC, mm. uh, banks don't offer fixed rates. And the reason for that is typically a, a building under construction would take anywhere from three to four years to complete. And, and so that is normally beyond the tenor of the fixed rates that are being offered in the market today. Uh, so that, that's really primarily the difference. Uh, the other difference is that uh, when you take a mortgage for a BUC, um, the, the commitment is disbursed progressively. So the loan isn't disbursed all at once, it's disbursed as the property is built up. And, and what that also means is that uh, uh, your, your mortgage commitment would last from the time you take the mortgage till the time um, the property is either TOP or CSE. So that's, that's typically how you, you know, the difference between a completed property and a, and a BUC. For a completed one, um, the loan is disbursed immediately um, once you've, you've made the purchase. And, and you can choose either a fix or a float package. Right. So if a consumer is actually looking to purchase their second private property as an investment, what are some of the things uh, you think that they should take note of before taking up a new loan? Well, um, I, I won't talk about um, the wisdoms of the second property as an investment. What I would say is uh, what customers should think about is, is this one thing called LTV loan to value so today uh, loan to value guides the total quantum of loan that a customer can take when purchasing a property uh, so on the first property the ltv is is the maximum ltv is 75 percent so if you're buying a one million dollar property you could take a seven hundred fifty thousand dollar loan but the moment you buy a second property in your name um, and if you're not taking a loan beyond 30 years the LTV drops to 45%. Uh, if you're taking a loan that goes beyond 30 years or if the tenor of the loan goes beyond age of 65, uh, then that 45% drops to 25%. So I think those are the things that um, customers should be aware of when they uh, want to think about buying a second property and how they would be financing that property. Definitely, I think uh, all our policies uh, in terms of LTV, I think has um 
put our clients in a very good position uh, not to over leverage if they, they have um, enough affordability to, to buy the next property definitely they would definitely have more cash on hand uh, so that they, they don't need to borrow so much mortgage uh, do you agree? I, I, I think the, the measures are, are supporting prudent um, buying of properties and, and LTV is a way of ensuring that the investment, because you know, that's what Ismail said, it, property is not something you can flip quickly. Uh, property tends to be a longer term investment and therefore I think the LTV um, guardrails are there to make sure that customers don't end up over leveraging themselves and they end up in financial trouble. Um, and so and so that's kind of the framework around it um, and, and it's there for customer protection really. Right, I think uh, what we have, all the policies uh, in, in the Singapore market really helps to keep the property sustainable in the long run and, I, and I'm, I'm glad this is, uh, uh, you know, reducing the amount of speculation that we have uh, and we all now see property as a longer term investment. So Roy, this one says, should I always take a shorter loan term and quickly pay off all my mortgage loans? Yeah, you know, uh, that's an interesting question too. Um, a shorter loan tenor means less interest paid over the life of the loan, but it also means a higher monthly instalment. Uh, whereas a longer tenor uh, would, would mean more interest paid over the life of the loan, however, your monthly outlay uh, is lower. So the conventional wisdom is you choose the tenor based on your your means and your 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 what you would like to do with your free cash. Um, you know, so we've seen situations where customers like to take long tenors because they believe that they can invest their cash in something else that can perhaps give them a higher return than a mortgage. And we've seen the flip as well, customers taking short uh, tenor mortgages because they don't like to be in too much debt over too long a period and therefore they like to keep the debt as short as possible. Uh, there's no right or wrong. It, it really depends on the outlook of the customer and what they like to do in terms of the financial planning. So while I am the mortgage head for City, uh, City has always seen mortgage and property ownership um, as part of uh, the wealth continuum of a customer. So Citibank ha is very committed in the Singapore market uh, in, in, in to help our wealthy affluent customers to manage their wealth. And in the Singapore market, property is seen very much as a wealth asset class. Um, people buy property for not just lifestyle aspiration, but they also buy property for legacy purposes. Uh, they buy property also as a, a form of um, wealth preservation, uh, because as we've been talking about, the Singapore market has been generally very stable and resilient. In, in, over long term, and and um, and that that has made property uh, uh, an investment class that people would like to to, to own. And so the uh, the advice I would give is don't just talk to a mortgage banker when you're deciding whether you want to take a longer or a shorter term uh, tenant mortgage. You should talk to a wealth manager, a relationship manager, because then you get a holistic view of what you want to do with all your wealth property just being one of them um, you know we we encourage diversification and our wealth management uh, specialists are there to advise customers uh, in that in that respect yeah talking about wealth accumulation maybe i will just uh, check in with mr ismail so in prop next uh, we have um, courses or trainings to to equip uh, real thoughts like myself about wealth creation um, to help our clients uh, accumulate their wealth through property. Uh, maybe you can share with us. Maybe I think what Roy said is very right in my view because you see when you look at it, it all has got to do with the very individual. Sometimes it has also got to do with their, what their parents have been uh, putting it in their head as don't take too much loan, stay free. So it's the nature of an individual. Yeah, I've seen people who actually qualify to take, let's say, $2 million loans based on their income and whatever, but they choose to buy a property and just take $1 million loan. 
And actually, on the flip side, if you look at it, Roy, there's another person who took the entire $2 million and bought two properties. Yeah. So basically, he's leveraging based on his ability to secure a loan. And, and therefore, actually, I think the person who just took $1 million is not wrong because he's comfortable and he, want, he thinks that he wants to sleep well. But perfectly all right. But the person who took advantage of the $2 million and he's using the bank's money to create more money by getting the rental yield and say about five years later, even if it goes up by 20% and he's made a 200000 on each property earning a 400000 versus someone who take a lesser loan and put all the cash and then a capital appreciation of 200000 So leveraging is a huge asset uh, using banks' money. Yeah. Uh, but that has got to do with your own individual comfort. That's important. But as far as PropLinx is concerned, we have designed a couple of courses. We call it as asset progression. We have got calculators. In fact, we also had for consumers some of these seminars and the training. We call it as the PWS uh, Property Wealth Seminar Series and so on. Because what we want uh, to help customers through our agents who are trained is to understand that each and individual needs are totally different and each and individual's commitments are also different. Yeah, whether you're looking after an aged parents or you have your children or what, what are your commitments? So my advice will be, take a holistic approach and understanding as like what Roy said, other than speaking to a banker, it could be a wealth manager, a real estate consultant or a specialist, so understand the market. And then you pause a moment and see what's best for you. To me, Real estate investment is not a short-term game. And I would suggest a mid and a long-term. And what is a mid-term in terms of definition? You should buy a property to hold at least for three years. That's the minimum. But my suggestion will be five years and beyond. Therefore, I always say that as investing in property, I dare used to say that, and I think I'm still correct, you can always make money as long as you decide when to exit. Not the economy force you or the bank force you, then it may not be at your best advantage. So we must always have that little reserve in our pocket when there's a cycle where maybe things are not going very well, but you must decide when to exit. So on that basis, real estate is definitely a good form of leveraging using banks' mortgages to accumulate your wealth. So I think uh, whichever decision or whichever loan package that they choose to take, I feel prudency is most important. Affordability and buying within your means is something that I always guide my, uh, my clients through uh, during their property purchases. I think that is more important and we don't want to, our clients to actually over leverage as well. So one last question for Roy over here. Uh, from one of our consumer, uh, should they always choose to take the lowest interest rate loan package? Yeah, that's a. You know, interest rates are very competitive. Uh, it's a very competitive market. We're a very developed market. Uh, uh, many players in the market. A lot of choice out there. Uh, and so, typically, what you see is interest rates are very competitive. Some higher, some lower, but not very far away. My, my advice is uh, to customers is don't, don't just look at the interest rate alone. Um, as I said earlier, a property purchase is something that uh, you don't do very many times in your life. Um, the loan you take is going to be the biggest loan you're, you're going to take in your life. Um, and so you should really look at the other features of the mortgage and the service that you get. Um, buying a property and taking a mortgage is a very technical affair. There are a lot of rules, regulations, um, all kinds of considerations. And so that's what I, I, you know, I think professionals in the space, whether they be property agents or they be mortgage bankers, uh, are there to help you to navigate that process. Um, one of the things I would say is look out for the service um, that you get, you're going to get, the responsiveness, because very often in a property purchase, Time is important. You, you, you want to make a decision, you're bidding against other buyers and you, you want a bank that's going to be able to get back to you in a timely fashion. 
you want a bank that's not just going to be an order taker that says I want a float rate here's your float rate you want a bank a banker who's going to be able to give you the right advice um, and give you the right options uh, so earlier I was talking about fixed rates and float rates um, so one of the interesting things that we do for our clients in a, in a situation where interest rates are very volatile and the difference in fixed rate and float rate is very large um, is we, we offer this thing called a hybrid loan. A hybrid loan is where a customer who is maybe buying a property and needs a $1 million mortgage, a customer can choose to take a portion of it in fixed and a portion of it in float. A customer can choose, I want to do 30-70, I want to do 50-50, and, and, and that's a way for a customer to, in a way, hedge their bets. Uh, so if interest rates rise, a portion of that mortgage would be fixed and stable over the next two or three years. And if interest rates remain low, the customer would have enjoyed the typically lower interest rates that the, 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 the float rate carries. So um, the advice I would give is don't just look at a rate you got to look at what the, uh, the bank can do for you, what the banker can do for you, what are the choices that they put in front of you. And um, one more thing that's interesting is we see a lot of customers being very financially savvy these days. And what that means is that customers don't just have cash in the bank. Customers over the, over the course of their lives would have invested in various things. Financial instruments, they would have some liquid cash, they would have some financial instruments. Um, in, a, in a typical vanilla mortgage, we look at the income based on a salary, uh, but increasingly we are seeing customers who are taking mortgages by introducing what we call eligible financial assets. And what that means is that you may have an income of say $5,000, um, which would give you a mortgage, I'm just making up the numbers, which gives you a mortgage of say half a million dollars. But if you've got other investments in your portfolio, you can show these to the banker and the banker can structure a mortgage taking into account these eligible financial assets. And so even though your income doesn't change, but the fact that you've got other financial assets such as cash or investments, um, you could get a mortgage that may be $700,000, for example. And so um, it's very important not just to look at the rate, but to um, engage with the banker Find a bank and a banker who's going to be able to give you the full range of options for you so that you can make your decision and you, you can make, make the choice that would suit you best. That, that's the advice I would give. Right, before we end the show, I have one last question each for our guests today. Um, so, in 2021, uh, we saw a very vibrant property market uh, and a very optimistic 2022 as well. So, Roy, what do you think, uh, what does City thinks about the mortgage space in Singapore moving forward? Well, um, City has always viewed mortgage as a very important part of our banking services that we offer to our clients. Uh, City had uh, recently announced um, our focus in the wealth space and in Singapore and Hong Kong, in Asia in particular. Um, and and uh, we are very dedicated to want to serve the Singapore market. So the mortgage, as I was sharing earlier, is uh, very important because we believe that property is, is an asset class that the Singapore market views as part of wealth. So if we want to serve our customers wealth needs, then we've got to be able to serve our customers property buying needs as well, which means that mortgage will continue to be very important. And uh, we continue to innovate, we continue to push into the, the advisory and the, and the um, services that I spoke of earlier, where we can offer customers choices, we can offer customers uh, options in terms of loan structuring. Uh, so that the customer can make a well-informed decision. Uh, so, you know, we, we hope 2022 will continue to be a good and stable year uh, for the property sector. And uh, we are very happy to continue supporting the property ecosystem with partners like yourselves, uh, Ismail, and, and, and our developer partners uh, to serve our customers better. Mr. Ismail, would you like to share a little bit more how Propnex will continue to trailblaze in 2022 in the, in the property scene? I think it's very important. We always put the focus of all the stakeholders. As far as consumers are concerned, I truly think there are opportunities. Because 
every challenge do provide some opportunities. Even when the cooling measures were announced, I look at it immediately. The winners are going to be Singaporeans, PRs, or for that matter, any first time buyers because they were not impacted by any of the cooling measures. The cooling measures announced on 15 December was specially targeted multiple property owners and as well as foreigners. So truly, if you are a first time buyer, if you are a Singaporean or for that matter, if you want to upgrade or right size, this may well be a right time. Not forgetting the fact, some of the future launches are going to be new benchmark prices. And we know that because the developers have paid uh, higher land bid prices. But there are existing stocks in the market that are based on the old land bid prices, which are rightly priced for the time being. And there are also opportunities which I think in 2022 will come in the core central regions. In the absence of the foreigners competing because of the increase in the stamp duties, developers are going to target Singaporeans to lure them in. And usually developers do give promotional stacks or discounts on weekends and things like that. So opportunities are plenty, and but you could only be able to take advantage when you are ahead in terms of your planning. Because you can't wake up one day and say when you see an, uh, uh, either a social media invite or in the media or in a broadcast to say, hey, there is a uh, special discount for 20 units, but we can't make a decision. We know that we are the very good bankers from City and anyone who can help you, but you yourself, are you ready to walk through? So that's why I say that it is always good. I always emphasize on planning, 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 and look at your assets and review your assets. And Propnex is committed to have a positive experience with every customer because we don't see it as just in a digit or a number. Every transaction is to make you as our friend. Thank you, boss, for the very kind words and thank you for also the very insightful tips as well as to Roy uh, sharing so much with our consumers. And as of all our episodes, to thank both of you for coming on this show, uh, we have prepared a very special drink for you. And shall we? All right, cheers to health and uh, wealth in 2022. And greater Thank happiness. You. Yep. Thank you. Happy yep. Happy cheers, New everyone. Year, yes. Happy New Year. Mm, looks like we're in Hawaii. <laughs> <laughs>